Okay, I think we can make a start now. So uh, welcome to Longview Economics webinar. For those that don't know Longview, we are an independent research firm writing global macroeconomic research with specific market outcomes on four different timeframes. Our goal is to help asset managers, wealth managers, hedge funds, individual investors to make more informed investment decisions. We service clients from some of the largest global asset managers to individual retail investors. We hope that some of you on this call might become clients one day. In this webinar, we'll discuss our thoughts on global equity valuations, in particular why, uh, whether the US stock market is more expensive than the rest of the world and why. Does it even matter? What else are our valuation models telling us? After the presentation, we'll have a short Q&A on valuation only. If you have questions on other topics, then you can email us separately or attend next week's more general webinar for our clients. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and you can write your question, which I will then ask Chris. With that, I'll hand over to Chris Watling, CEO and Global Market Strategist at Longview Economics. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Nick. And uh, welcome, everyone. It's great. It's great. Uh, great to be doing this. Great to see lots of people on the call. Lots of familiar names and lo lots of not so familiar names, which is fantastic. So uh, let me dig in. As, as Nick said, the title is uh, The Expensive US Versus the West. What's going on? And, and first of all, before I get going, I want to contextualize how this how this fits in our bigger process. You know, we 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 uh, we basically write five categories of publications. One of those categories is asset allocation, uh, global asset allocation, which is sort of strategic thinking six months to two years. And then we also do tactical asset allocation, which is really more of the sort of one to four month time frame on equity market direction. And the global asset allocation process is headed up by Harry Colvin. Many of you all know, uh, uh, senior market strategist, director at Longview, uh, runs that side of things. And every quarter, he gets out five quarterly pieces. I get involved in bits and pieces of it. And part of what I get involved in is the valuation analysis that we're going to talk about today. Uh, but you can see on the right-hand side, we've published five quarterly uh, asset allocation pieces over the course of the last month. Uh, and that involves Eurozone macro analysis, US macro analysis, Chinese macro analysis, the valuation section on 24th of March that we're going to talk about now. And then the conclusions 30th of March, the last section to come out where Harry uh, puts forward our asset allocation recommendations on a six month to two year time frame. As uh, Nick sort of alluded to in, in, the, in the intro, Harry's going to be talking about those in detail on Friday next week, the 14th of April. That's a webinar that's available for clients and trialists. So if you're interested in that, please do contact Nick or Info or Harry directly, and we can get you involved in that on a trial or if you're a client, get you on the call as well. So I'm going to focus today on the valuation analysis, the piece we published on the 24th of March. And hopefully we'll we'll give you some insights on that, and um, get some Q and A going at the end of the end of the end of the end of the uh, sort of thirty or so minutes. So I'm going to talk for about thirty or so minutes. Then we're going to get into Q and A. So let's get into it. So what's the build up? Well, the last time we gave a public webinar was back in September 2021. 2021. Uh, we were sort of still in the pandemic, as you'll remember. We are getting towards the end of it, really, end of 2021. And at the time, the, 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 the webinar was about the idea of the end of TINA. And TINA, of course, there is no alternative, a well-known acronym now. Really, the idea that central banks had bullied everyone into taking more and more risk in their portfolios, pushing them up the risk curve, pushing them into equities, getting rid of the yield that was available on bonds and most sort of safe income so that, uh, 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 so that investors whether you're an individual investor or an asset allocator or, or whatever, was, was pushed into very risky stuff. That was the, the effect of ZERP and NERP and QE policies. And at the time, we argued, as you can see in this quote, that when central banks had to start dealing with inflation, their tone would change. And if you remember back to 2021, there was still this idea that you know, there, would, there was always a Fed put. That, that people found it hard to believe it would go away. 
But I think our view was once you've got inflation, that ZERP and NERP and QE, that attitude of the central banks would switch and they would start pricking the bubble. And for those of you that love Charles Kindleberger, one of the great financial historians, his contextualization of bubbles over the centuries is very simple. The framework is very simple. Three or four things create a bubble, and that includes cheap money, a fantastic story, uh, evaluations become excessive, and there's normally a lot of debt associated with bubbles. Those are the things that create bubbles, but only one thing bursts a bubble, and that is the removal of cheap money. So as soon as, as soon as inflation showed up and the central banks had to change their tune, remove ZERP, remove NERP, tighten interest rates, jack up rates, address inflation, the bubble burst. And of course, that, that's really what we started to see in 2022. And you can see on the right hand side, if you look at household net financial assets, so this is only financial assets. This doesn't include their houses. It's just the sort of equities, bonds, mutual funds, pension fund holdings, all of that relative to GDP. You can see by Q2 2021, they have become extremely expensive in aggregate relative to GDP, and they began to deflate. But what you observe as you look at that chart is they're an awful long way from their last peak in 2007 or the peak in 2000. So you know, maybe I would argue the deflation is just beginning. So, so that's the build-up. That was Tina. What did Tina do? Uh, it created emergency monetary policy in the pandemic. Central banks did that. They they pushed interest rates down uh, to zero. Uh, tip shields went negative. The only other time they did that in 2012. And of course, last year was really about adjusting tip shields up from emergency minus one and a half percent, getting them back up to a more normal level as we saw the course of 2022. And if you look at the charts on the right-hand side, uh, the bottom one has got a pretty clear, clear correlation in the last few years between the tips yield and the earnings yield of the S&P 500. In other words, as the tips yield backed up, so did the earnings yield back up. In other words, the PE ratio is falling on the, on the, on the US stock market. So normalizing monetary policy, the end of TINA, the removal of ZERP and NERP, the end of QE, the addressing of inflation by jacking up rates began the process of unwinding the excessive valuation and began the process of unwinding TINA. So, I mean, as we look at it today, TINA's dead. There really is an alternative. And I think this is critical. If you think we've had 12 plus years of financial repression where central banks have bullied investors into risky assets, uh, pushed them out of income yielding stuff, it's not going to unwind in 12 months. That 12 years of financial repression is going to take time. It takes time for investors to decide to reallocate. It takes time for them to take money out of equities and push it into money market funds where you can yield 4 or 5%, as you see on the right-hand side, or into any of these other assets that have actually got quite attractive yields. So the point is then is there is now an alternative, and the unwind of that concentration in equity risk and other risky assets is happening and it's underway. So, you know, Tina's dead. We're moving on. The US started to derate. But the point is, it's still expensive. Even though the S&P 500 fell 25% last year, it is still expensive. And you get a flavor for that looking at the, the valuation of the US market on a, on a sort of simple absolute PE ratio. In a moment, I'll compare it to something. But on an absolute PE ratio, the, the stock market in the States is expensive. On the left-hand side, it's a sort of straightforward S&P 500, forward PE ratio trading 17 and a half times the next 12 months consensus earnings estimates. Now, if you look at that chart, you would observe that it's only really been more expensive in bubbles, in the TMT bubble in 2000 to 2002, and then in the pandemic bubble from 2020 to 2021. <clears throat> The rest of the time, it's barely ever above 17.6 6 times. That's really the top end of the normal range of the PE ratio over the last 40 years. And I'm pretty sure that if you made that 100-year chart, uh, except for perhaps 1929, 1930, all other PE ratios would be below 17.5, or, or that would be pretty much the upper limit. So, so on, a, on a standalone four PE ratio, the, the S&P is expensive. You take a, a, a Schiller... CAPE P ratio on the right hand side, where you look at the, the, the market valued against 10 years of average earnings, 
a sort of cyclically adjusted PE ratio. Again, same point, it's still very expensive uh, and has only just begun its process of revaluing. So on a standalone basis, it's expensive, but it, equally on a relative basis, the market's not cheap. On the left-hand side, it's sort of classic, straightforward, plain vanilla equity risk premium. And that risk premium has actually shrunk in the last six months. Uh, as the markets rallied since October, the risk premium has narrowed. It's become richer stock market, a more expensive stock market. And if you look at a, a sort of very sort of simplistic earnings yield on the right hand side, just against the two year government bond yield, we're not far off that classic sort of bubble territory that we saw in 99, 2000. The gap between two year government bond yields and the S&P's earnings yield is pretty, pretty small, unusually small. Now, you can question the, the validity of, of that kind of model, fair enough. But it makes the point pretty clear the, the market's not cheap on a relative basis. And in fact, we have a proprietary valuation model that adjusts for all sorts of bells and whistles. We really look at what the equity risk premium is on an observed basis relative to what it should be if we think about the relative riskiness of equities versus bonds and their relative yield characteristics. And if you if you look at it on that metric, we're getting our first sell signal on equities as you can see in this chart, really since the, the end of 2006, 2007. So it's a pretty good model. It kept you into the bull market, kept you in the bull market really from 2000 and late 2009, 2010, all the way through uh, to um, the last sort of six, seven months ago. So it's a pretty good valuation model. Valuation models are not good at market timing, but they're good at long-term thinking. And I think this model has got a pretty clear message that you should sell equity. So, so the US market is expensive on a standalone basis. It's expensive on a relative basis uh, on different types of models uh, in aggregate. But interestingly, if you dig down into the US market, it's a different picture. There's enormous divergence within the US market. And here on the left-hand side is one of the things we like to update every quarter. We do this for the US. We do it for Europe, we do it for the UK, we do it for a bunch of markets. And what we're showing you on the left-hand side is a distribution curve of the PE ratios of 4,000 stocks in the US market. So it's across the breadth of the US market, includes small and mid caps, uh, the big caps, the mega caps, and so on, the full breadth of the US market. And, and then you plot a distribution curve with along the x-axis, the, the PE ratios, and then the y-axis is the percentage of stocks in each PE band, if you like. So a couple of observations. I mean, what's fascinating is the curve at the moment, March 2003, March 2023, sorry, is heavily shifted leftwards. Now that's pretty weird. That's at odds superficially with what we just saw with an expensive headline PE ratio. That's kind of got a different message. The message of the, 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 the green curve, the March 2023 curve, is that most stocks are cheap. And in fact, it's quite a, what's interesting is not only are most stocks cheap, but it's actually quite a similar shape to what we saw in March 2000 at the peak of the TMT bubble. And then, of course, what we observed was most stocks were cheap. I remember um, quite a few uh, defensive stocks, uh, a lot of uh, yield sensitive stocks were very cheap in March 2000. And a lot of a bunch of them had um uh, dividend yields above their PE ratio. The one that comes to mind is actually a British stock that was British American tobacco, extremely cheap, cheap in early 2000, but also the case with a lot of US stocks that we're looking at here. So, so the, 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 the mass of stocks are cheap, and you can see a confirmation of that from the right-hand chart, which is a, a medium PE ratio looking across those 4,000 stocks, whereas the middle PE ratio each month, and it's at extremely low levels. And once again, if you look at the comparison with 2000, it's very similar. So within the US market, there's a lot of valuation disparities. There's a lot of cheap stocks. And that message is confirmed if you just look at the, uh, the mid caps on the left, look at the PE ratio, forward PE ratio, so bottom, near the bottom end of the range, not far off minus two standard deviations. Uh, if you look at the, the small caps, the S&P 600, very similar sort of message. Or indeed, of course, if you look at the NASDAQ relative to the mid and small caps, the relative PE ratio has got a big gap. So, so there's big disparities. Tech, of course, is dominant with rich PE ratios, as you'll be aware, and as we'll come on to. And uh, anyone that's been watching the market this year has, has noted that NVIDIA's PE ratio is now at 
57 times forward earnings. At the start of the year, it was about 25 times. So what's right? Should it be 25 or 57 times? You know, the, 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 the point is um, tech is extremely expensive. Parts of the US market are very expensive. The breadth of the US market has got a lot of opportunities in it. So, 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 so within the US, there's, there's, a, there's a wide dispersion of valuation on offer. Uh, in aggregate, it looks expensive, the US, but within it, you get a lot of different outcomes. So what about earnings? Because earnings is an important part of this equation. And all the P ratios I just showed you, showed you a, a, a P ratio based on forward consensus earnings. And I would argue that forward consensus earnings in general are too rich. And they're still, they need to adjust. They need to price in a recession, but they also need to price in a normalization of margins. So if you look at the margins that have been baked in in the last 12, 18, 24 months, they are at record highs. On the left-hand chart, you can see that red line shows you the fact set US margin uh, for the US market in 2022 Q2, reaching 10.6%, the highest on record and coming off a bit from those levels, but still above where it was even in 2019, early 2020, and above where it normally gets to in cyclical highs. So we've had record high corporate margins in the US. And in fact, if you look over 50 years, we show you the blue line is the corporate profit share of GDP, shows you that we're pretty high relative to history. So, and above that level, if you like. So, so, so uber high profit margins that need to normalize, uh, step one, but of course in recessions, margins get squeezed hard. You can see that in, in the recessions, the gray bars, uh, the margins always go down, of course, as operating leverage works a bit, works against the companies. Revenues come under pressure and costs are slower to be cut and margins get squeezed. So, so you know, earnings are still elevated. They haven't priced in a normalization of margins, number one. And number two, they haven't priced in a recession in margins. And, you know, some people say to me, well, hold on, maybe that's just tech. Tech's got very high margins, maybe it's something special going on there. Maybe that's why we have such high margins in 2022 in Q2 and why margins seem unusually high. But actually, no, if you dig into the detail here, and we've gone through all the sectors of the US market, um, and you can see them listed on the left-hand side, two groups uh, highlighted in particular, ones that are close to record high margins or at them, or have been at them very recently. And then ones that are just at cyclically high margins. And, you know, a couple of points. I mean, clearly it's not just tech. Electronic tech is part of it, uh, but it's other sectors as well. We had retail had very high margins 12, 18 months ago, because of course there was so many, so much buying of goods, boosting their margins, and they could achieve with inflation, they could achieve a margin pickup that took them to record levels. Similarly, finance, another great example. In 2020, they took a lot of loan loss provisions. In 2021, they unwound those loan loss provisions, boosted profit, boosted their margins. And of course, electronic tech as well. But so there's a ton of sectors at record high margins over the last 12, 18 months that have got to normalize number one, and then number two, price in recession. And then on top of that, most of the other sectors, pretty much all of them, only a couple of exceptions, most of them have got cyclically high margins anyway. So margins are going to come under pressure. And this is what I think is quite interesting. When you think about the market, you think about the valuation of the US, it's trading on 17 and a half times forward PE ratio, but on elevated earnings. You know, if we're actually going to get a recession, as many think, and Harry will talk about in lots of detail on his webinar next Friday, uh, Friday week, the 14th of April, if we're going to get a recession, you've got to normalize these earnings from here. These are these have only come off about 5% from their peaks. And a normal recession gets them off about 20%. What about a recession where you've got a, a double hit to margins? A normalization of margins, one, followed by two, um, a pricing in a recession on margins. So, so earnings is an issue. The US is expensive. Well, how does it look relative to the rest of the world? Well, the answer is it looks expensive. So very simply, on the right-hand side, there's about 40 stock markets uh, with forward P ratios on consensus earnings in order of their highest P ratios. Look at the red dots. The red dots is where they are at the moment. The gray gives you the sense of the width of their normal history, of their P ratio and the, and the quartiles and the mean and the mediums and things like that. 
But what you can see quite clearly is the US is the fourth most most expensive market out there. It's it's very expensive, and you see on the on the left hand chart relative to the rest of the world, the US's PE ratio is as toppy as it was in the end of the TMT bubble, and almost one of its toppiest moments in the last 25, 30 years. So the US is expensive. If you look at it relative to the UK, you look at it uh, left-hand chart, you look at it relative to Europe, top right-hand chart, or even emerging markets, not as compelling, but still same message. Um, it's uh, Fact no, sorry, I'm not talking about the USM. I'm confusing myself. The UK looks cheap relative to the world, in contrast to the US that looks expensive here, and Europe looks cheap, and EM's not is mid range basically. But but the but but the, the 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 sort of pushback on that is, well, sure, the US looks expensive, but it's got better stocks in it, better sectors. It's got higher growth sectors. It's got more tech. The weighting in the US in tech is about. Uh, if you include growth stocks, the broader growth stocks index, we're, we're looking at almost half the index is those better, higher earnings growth sectors. So, so actually, you need to adjust for that. And that's exactly what we've done here. We've done a sector weighted uh, PE ratio of the US, the Eurozone, the UK. And then we've compared the US to the Eurozone, both sector weighted or full consensus earnings. And then we compared on the right hand side, the US to the UK sector weighted. And what you'd observe is actually the U.S. in aggregate tends to be more expensive, even when you equal weight the sectors. So the, the, the red lines is the average. And in the States, the P.E. ratio on average is one and a half percentage points, one and a half P.E. points above Europe. It's almost three P.E. points normally above the U.K. So that, that, that it's a higher return on equity stock market. It's a better bunch of companies that deliver more earnings growth. So on average, it is worth more even when you sector adjust it. But my point here is, if you look at the US relative to the Europe and the UK, the gap is wide and it's meaningfully above that, that long-term average, that long-term uh, bias towards the US. And in fact, if you look, take the UK, it says to me that the UK looks like it's going to have a period of outperformance as it unwinds the excessive uh, richness of the U.S. market's valuation relative to the U.K. Uh, when you when you sector weight, so not only an absolute but a sector equal weighted P ratio shows you that you should favour U.K. equities in the long term. Now, as I said, valuation doesn't really help you in the short term, but it helps in the long term and it gives some sense of direction. and And that's why I wanted to finish up talking about the long cycles and really thinking about the three to five year view on where you should put money in the world and a, and a longer term view of asset allocation. So I'm not gonna cover the six months, the next six, 12 months that, as I said, Harry's gonna be covering Friday next week, but I'm gonna cover the very long cycles, the secular cycles, because straight up, I think there's a very strong argument that we're changing leadership in the global, global stock market, we're changing leadership in the global asset allocation market, and we're entering new secular cycles that are different from the ones we've had running into the pandemic in the five, 10 years running into it. And part of the reason is I think in the US, everyone's all in. Everyone's kind of all in on equities. If you look at this chart on the left-hand side, it's a chart we've been putting around for the last few years. I think it's a fascinating chart. A statistician would tell us we haven't got many data points. It's not valid, but actually theoretically, it makes a ton of sense. And what you see here is the, the, the red line, what we're showing you is that households asset allocation to financial assets. And really the message of this chart is when households are, are up to the yin yangs in equities, and generally in the US, that'll be US equities, then you get that, that period gets followed by a secular bear market in equities. Look at 2000 quarter one, up to the yin yang in US equities, 10, 12 years of sideways uh, US performance and underperformance by the US equity market of the rest of the world. This is, by the way, this is a US phenomenon. Everyone's been bullied into, into tech and growth. They've become overexposed to it. And now we've got to unwind that. And that unwinding takes a long period of time. And interestingly, that unwinding correlates with a Schiller PE ratio. So we looked at that earlier, expensive US market correlates with how much weight of money you've had, money going into this into this area of the global equity market. The US has been favored for five or six years. The tech has been the leadership. And you can see that in the left-hand chart. So, so they're all in, 
and now a paradigm shift is taking place. Households are starting to move money out of equities into other asset classes. You can see that on the left-hand side. If you look at the flows into US Treasury securities by households, in the last two quarters, they've been like, wow, I like that yield. I'll have some of that. I need to change my asset allocation. It's too equity heavy. I need some fixed income in there because the yields on offer are pretty interesting. And the mutual mon money market funds are another indication of that, as you see on the right-hand side, very strong flows into money market funds. So, so markets have fashions. The leadership, the sector leadership, this is something we like to look at all the time, changes all the time. You know, every five or six years, you get different sector leadership in the global stock market. And different countries have different sector weightings. And the, in the US, of course, it's tech and growth. So for the last five or six years, the US markets led the global stock market up until the end of 2021. Now, going forwards, I think we're going to go back to a more sort of naughty style uh, five, six year leadership with commodities. I think some of the Western banks will come back into play, not now, but later this year, into next year. And the sector leadership is going to change and it will favor the UK, it will favor Europe and so on. And I think with that sector leadership, value will be favored over growth. And we've started to see in the right hand chart that movement has started to happen. And interesting, this the dollar tends to play into that as well. You know, the relative secular trends in the dollar, <clears throat> when the dollar is strong, it tends to be good capital flows into the US, strong growth stocks, and actually US economic growth move, pushes away from European growth, pushes away from emerging market growth. When, when, the, when, when actually the capital is flowing elsewhere, and tech is going into a bit of a bus phase, which I would argue Silicon Valley is sort of in at the moment, and that's going to persist. It's got to unwind its success. Capital flows away, the dollar tends to underperform. So I think on a three to five year view, the, the dollar will struggle. Other currencies will do better. Uh, just look at the pound. I mean, the number of times it's, it's hit key support levels on a trade weighted basis in the last decade is quite something. You know, a number of overseas non-dollar currencies will outperform and capital will flow to those stock markets. So this is all part of the, the new secular cycle. And it's all summarized really in this uh, in this chart we show here, uh, which has got a lot of info on it. It's pretty interesting. I, I would argue that uh, this sort of thing has got a lot of insights. You, you can't set your watch by it, but it gives you a lot of insights into the ebb and flow of fashions in markets. And really what you see is a commodity super cycle brewing. And like in the noughties or in the 70s or in the 30s and 40s, when we had commodity super cycles, we had secular bear markets in U.S. equities and we had non-U.S. equities outperforming the U.S. and being the place to put your money. The red line on the right and the left hand chart show U.K. relative to U.S. right hand chart. Canadian relative to US left hand chart, look at the noughties, the currencies outperform and the stock markets outperform. It's also a commodity super cycle. They're commodity type equity markets as well, particularly Canada, also Australia. I think we're back to that. So, you know, I think 2023 is an opportunity to reweight yourself and position yourself into the things you want to buy over the next three to five years, if you're a long-term investor. But it's quite clear to me that US equity markets are expensive on a standalone basis. Uh, they're expensive on a relative basis. And actually there's a lot of value overseas where the currencies are cheaper and there's more to go for and there's better sector composition as we unwind the excess that's built up in tech in the last five years. So. That's kind of the conclusions of our valuation section. Uh, I'd love it if there are any questions. As mentioned, if you want to dig into the detail of, of the next six, nine, 12 months of asset allocation, come on to the webinar next Friday, the 14th of April. Uh, but hopefully that's been interesting and insightful. Love to take any questions and uh, dig into that in a bit more detail. Thank you for your time. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button. Uh, if you have any questions, please write them and we'll ask Chris. Uh, there are already a couple on there, so let me get cracking. Chris, um, I think you already alluded to the fact that US perhaps has better quality stocks. 
um, hence it's more expensive. However, this question, cheap markets can just get cheaper while expensive markets simply get more expensive. This has been the case in the past decade or, or so. It strikes me that macro themes drive markets, not valuation. Does that undermine the case for using valuation as a tool in your investment process? <clears throat> Well, that's a great question. I mean, I'd use valuation as a tool in conjunction with the macro themes. So the big picture macro theme, if you're really sort of doing full full on helicopter view, supports this sector suggestion. And I think really, if you think about it, we've gone from a world that had lack of demand post financial crisis. You know, it was a world where they were we were rebuilding household balance sheets, rebuilding banks capital ratios. They're complying with Basel three and four. Uh, in the US, the banks are paying a lot of fines that came straight out of equity capital. All of that's deflationary, really. It produces a lack of demand as people save and rebuild balance sheets and so on. So in that environment, you end up with either the hunt for yield or you end up with the hunt for secular growth. And those are the two themes post-financial crisis through to the pandemic. And as I said, you know, in bear markets, fashions change. And I think we've burst the tech bubble I know it's had a good flurry in the last three months, but it did have a good flurry in the middle of the 2000, 2002 bear market. And I think we're moving towards the new sector leadership, which is driven by the next big macro theme and complemented by valuation. And the next big macro theme on one level is from lack of demand post financial crisis to lack of supply going forwards. And there's a ton of reasons for suggesting that. But firstly, I mean, I think we have a commodity super cycle. Uh, for lots of reasons. One of them is the decarbonization of the economy, the greenification, you know, the old story that there's not enough copper to, to build these electric vehicles for a start, never mind all the other commodities we need, but also deglobalization, which is accelerated with, with the latest sort of bifurcation of the world into, into two groups. Fascinating to see the, the Saudi geopolitics, them joining the Shanghai Security Cooperation arrangement or joining as a dialogue partner in the last few months, uh, China brokering the Iran-Saudi uh, reconciliation deal. These, these extraordinary changes in the geopolitical world. Saudi this week uh, leading OPEC to cut production at the annoyance of the US. So, so deglobalization is a big theme that drives inflation. And then most of all, I think we, you know, post-financial crisis, it was fiscal austerity. Now we've opened the sort of magic money tree and we've opened the helicopter money toolkit. And I suspect whenever there's stress, we'll get a policy response. And in fact, we saw that with the banking crisis in March, a policy response, quite aggressive. In fact, if you look at the BTFP, uh, it changed the rule book for lender of last resort, central banks, offering uh, liquidity uh, using collateral at par is not what you are supposed to do as a central banker. They change the rule book. So the liquidity responses, the policy responses, when there's stress, they come, which means you're probably going to get more rounds of helicopter money as we go forwards, which supports the idea that average inflation over the next five, six, seven, eight years will be higher than the last 10. It'll be much higher normal GDP growth, whereas it was all about finding growth 10 years ago, over the last post-financial crisis. So, so I think, I mean, I think the macro theme is consistent with the valuation disparity and they all play into each other quite nicely. So we, we try and keep an eye on both. Okay, thank you. Um, what, what would trigger the structurally higher growth, more dynamic, younger US versus Europe to really underperform? Well, you know, I think it's uh, it ha it started last year. Um, we had a we had a first bout of it. I think we're sort of in the uh, intermittent phase, and maybe there's some challenges as over the next six months for Europe as we price in a recession, as as we'll be hearing about next Friday. Um, but I think really, you know, what what's going to trigger it to underperform? It's the weight of money. You know, look at look at that that slide we showed earlier that everyone was all in. Households were, were all in on U.S. equities, which means they're primarily all in on tech. And even now, you know, I talk to clients and they still want to pull the um, get back into tech trigger, despite the fact that something like NVIDIA, stock like NVIDIA is now rated at 50 times forward earnings. So I think as liquidity continues to tighten up, 
money is tight. It's getting tighter. That's what the banking crisis is going to do. Those stocks that are most sensitive to liquidity will come under the most pressure. So I uh, I think um, tight money, ongoing QT, de-weightings of markets, that's all part of that story. OK, thank you. This year has shown tech as a place to hide. If the recession comes, do you see tech continuing to perform despite your views you've just explained? Well, that's something I think Harry will be getting into next Friday. But the short answer is, uh, I no, I don't think they'll continue to outperform. OK, thank you. Um, under what circumstances could the US avoid a recession and current earnings estimates come to fruition? Well, again, we'll cover that next week. Not to be not to be tricky, but I don't want to steal Harry's thunder. Uh, all that stuff's going to come through. Can we avoid a recession? There's always possibilities, and I'm sure Harry will touch on some of them, but it's not our central case. OK, thank you. Uh, are you advocating for tilting to US small and mid cap versus US large cap? How do you consider the greater sensitivity to rising rates uh, of mid cap as you evaluate their valuations today? I would I, I'm advocating tilting towards them in, in major pullbacks this year. I think 2023. Uh, and for those of you who picked up on this wonderful Benner cycle, I'm not saying it's the way to run your portfolio, but 2023 in there is supposed to be a year of opportunity. And I think that's a fair comment. And use pullbacks to move into things that look cheap and um, will benefit as you come out of the recession. And I think smaller mid caps is part of that. OK. Um, next question. Households may be up to the gills in equities, but often hear that institutions are actually at almost record low exposure partly because the big ones are forced to buy government debt, particularly an issuance of that is likely to just increase. So equity markets might all struggle to go up. Do you agree with that? Well, we're unwinding the everything bubble. So, um, you know, I think um, the exposure to equities in general has been very high. Institutions have definitely taken it down in the last 12 months. And, you know, if you look at the Merrill Lynch Fund Manager Survey, it looks like they've, they're, they're pretty pessimistic. But I suspect their weightings can go much lower and household and retail weightings certainly can. If you look at Charles Schwab cash holdings, look at AAII cash levels, none of those are at anything like bear market low extremes. And they both suggest a long way to go in terms of unwinding equity ownership. OK, thank you. Um, how do emerging markets fare in the world you're describing? They, they, I think they should fare well, like Europe. Um, you might want to be somewhat selective. Um, there's a lot of issues in China. Uh, but uh, basically, I would say in secular upswings for Europe and, and, and non-US assets, emerging markets tend to get caught up in that. They like commodity super cycles as well. So on a three to five year view, again, this wouldn't be uh, what we're talking about in the next six, 12 months, but this is the three to five year view. Take advantage of weakness to, to do this. Yeah, I think it, they'll do well because structurally, a lot of those emerging markets, not China, but a lot of the other ones are in quite good shape from an economic structural sense. They haven't got all the sort of deficits you might worry about. Some of them are pretty cheap and a lot of them benefit from commodity super cycle upswings. And upswings in 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 uh, sort of value stocks and those kind of parts of the market. So, so we like that area as well on on a three to five year view. Okay, thank you. Um, what kind of margin correction do you expect in the UK and US? Well, as you know, the minimum is to go back to normal. Uh, and then we would expect beyond that. I mean, I think, you know, if, if we're going to get a recession, you've got to price in margin tight recessions. And uh, I think that's perfectly plausible. The question is how quickly it, it, it plays out. Uh, that's the, the, the real question. And I'm, I'm often reminded of that chart of the, the UK stock market in World War II, uh, troughing in 1940, when all seemed lost. And, uh, you know, we had the Dunkirk evacuation that famous film that, that came out a couple of years ago when it looked like all had lost uh, nazi germany had advanced 
uh, uh, and was about to take the UK as well. So the UK stock market troughs then in 1940, rallies all the way through to 1947, and then spends five years trending down, unwinding the excess of liquidity that happened over World War II and just after, and unwinding the fiscal excess. And so, you know, that that's the question. How quickly do you unwind those excessive margins? Is it short and sharp, or is it that policymakers don't have the stomach and they draw it out over a prolonged period of time? Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, I think we'll leave it there. Um, have you got any closing remarks? Um, just to throw up uh, for those that are interested, if you want more detail on the macro and the, and the, and the six-month asset allocation, uh, Harry will be hosting that webinar. As, as, as I said, it's for clients and trialists. If you're interested in a trial, get in touch with Nick, uh, who's hosting his emails there, or drop us a line at info or drop Harry a line. That'd be great. Thank you very much for everyone's time. I hope it was useful. Do let us know. Um, we're certainly up for doing um, occasional public webinars, and if people find them interesting, we're happy to dip in and out of certain topics every once in a while. So um, any feedback, much appreciated. Thank you for your time, and thank you, Nick, for, for hosting. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, everyone, for joining. <laughs>